Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for Syringe Drivers in End of Life Care. My name is Phoebe James and I'm a Professional Development Officer with the Hunter New England and Central Coast Primary Health Network. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of lands we are all meeting on today. Um, we are all here in beautiful Awabakal country and pay my respects to Elders past, present and any First Nations people joining us today. Just some housekeeping. Um, we're going to have some questions and some interactions via Slido, so that will be available on the right hand side of your screen. Um, we have our amazing Charles Broadfoot who will be um, facilitating that function for us. Um, in the same vein, we will have an evaluation at the end and that will also pop up on the right hand side of your screen. If you could complete that for us, it will be amazing. Today presenting, we have Emma McNamara, who is a palliative and end of life care nurse educator. Oh, and I hand over to you, Emma. Thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. Hello, everybody out there um, logging on today. I'm super excited to be here and to be asked by the PHN to run some education um, today on the bodyguards and the syringe drivers in end of life. So thank you. I do have, um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions at the beginning. Um, so if we can pop the answers in the chat and Charles will look at them for me. So that will be fabulous. But let's get started. Oh, so who am I? I'm the palliative and end of life care nurse educator for Hunter New England Local Health District. And I cover the whole of the district. Um, and um, I'm also available for you if you need um, some help or guidance. And it's been a, um, great to log on and be a part of this today. So we're looking at syringe drivers in end of life care. And I just need to acknowledge straight away from the very beginning, all of the information that I'm bringing you today and we're talking about today are from two fabulous resources um, from the Bodyguard T syringe pump resource website. And Charles is going to pop that in the link there uh, for us. You do have to create an account with that, but it has some, um, I'll, I'll just show you quickly now, um, it has some fabulous um, online learning um, to get you really familiar with the um, Bodyguard T pump and it takes you through step by step, um, super duper easy. Um, so you can implement that in your facility. Let's just go back to the main page. And we also have, oh, this one is my absolute favourite. Um, this is, was developed by Power Consult up in Queensland. Um, they do some amazing work up there with Care Search. Um, they also developed the Caring at Home resources that you might be familiar with. But this, this one, I, I cannot stress enough that this is definitely one that you would implement into your facility. Um, we do this as standard across Hunter New England and we refer to this as our policy procedure. And so um, there's lots of components in this website. Um, so there's online education modules. And so we make it standard that all new clinicians using the bodyguards or the syringe drivers um, do these modules and pop them into their learning transcript. There is this fabulous practical handbook in there. So you could print that out also um, and use that and keep that if you're storing these in a central spot. The handbook can be used there. There's lots of videos and we're going to be showing a couple of those today in our session. And there's also competency checklists. So this, this site I just love and um, highly recommend that we become familiar with that. But these are the two major um, resources that we're going to be using today. Um, along with our Hunter New England, we'll, I'll be taking things out of our policy procedure as well. So I do work for Hunter New England and I follow all policy procedures uh, for that. But you would use your local, um, what your local ones are there. So what we're talking about today is we're talking about syringe drivers. And we have, um, we often use a lot of different names for syringe drivers, so we can call them a syringe pump, a subcutaneous infusion pump, or sometimes we call them a skip for short. I don't think skip's the proper acronym and I don't think we can put it in our medical records, but we often do say skips. Um, so that's what we're looking at today. I'm going right back to basics, um, so I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence here, but we're going to start right back at phase one. So let's have a quick look at um, 
what is a syringe pump. Um, and we can see that it's a little battery um, portable battery operated device that delivers medicine at a constant rate over an extended period. So usually about 24 hours that period is to maintain a steady blood level of the medicine. So that's key here, to maintain that steady blood level of the medicine. Okay, they're portable, battery operated, so people can go home with them. Um, so a syringe pump delivers medicines through a system. So through the cannula, we start off with the, the cannula. Oops, there. An extension set which connects to the cannula. So we all have different ones there. I'll tell you what one we recommend. And then also the syringe. So the pump pushes the plunger of the syringe here at a steady rate and medicines delivered through the extension set and the tubing and the cannula um, under the, just under the person's skin, okay? Um, and then it's absorbed into the body. So we're talking about subcutaneous there, so just underneath the skin. So we're not talking intravenous, we're not talking intramuscular, it's through this tiny little cannula which is subcutaneous, okay? So let's just have a look at that a little bit more. So when we're looking at our subcutaneous cannula here, you can see on the slide there's a few different components to this cannula. So if I get a fresh one out of the packet, let me just move those couple of little things here. We can see that there's the sheath here that has the needle. These are what we call our wings, our little butterfly wings here. There's a side clamp here for clamping, but we take them off. We don't use the slide clamps for these subcutaneous butterflies because they cause a lot of pressure injuries. They also um, can be inadvertently clamped, and I'll explain a little bit more about why we take them off as well in a moment, okay? Um, we've got the little Y arm here. So this is where the... Um, the line would connect to here and then once we've inserted it this is where we retract um, our safety shield retract the needle from. While I've got this cannula here and I'll just use one that doesn't have the needle in it, from here to here it's very important that we learn that this is only 0.5 of a mil. The total volume from this point to this point is 0.5 of a mil. Really important for us to, um, to think about that. Let me take my little slide clamp off there. So let's just have a look at our syringe. So it only needs 0.5 of a mil to go from this end to this end. All right? So we'll talk about that a bit more. Let's get to that. Then I mentioned that we've got our syringe and our line, okay, and we'll talk about them as we go. But let's go back to some um, basics as to why we use um, syringe pumps. Charles, I think this is a great time for people to pop um, in, the, in the comments box there um, as to why do we use syringe pumps. I've given you a little bit of an intro into what they are. But let's talk about why we would use them. If we want to pop some in the comments, that would be great. Um, I'll give a couple of minutes to see if we get some answers. I think we've got some coming through. So great for us to think. And when we're educating um, in our services, we really want to think about why, why are we doing this? It's so important. Why, why are we using these? So, let's look at continuous subcutaneous infusions of medicines administered using a syringe pump is common and accepted practice in palliative care for assisting with pain and symptom management. When other routes of... Uh, can we delete that bit? Cut, we'll go back. When other routes of administration are inappropriate or ineffective. So let's think about that. Syringe pumps are portable 
They're suitable for all clinical settings. They're preset to deliver medicines over a fixed period of time, which is going through the points here. You can read them as well. We're able to provide a constant levels of medicine, ensuring that those plasma concentrations remain at the optimal therapeutic level. So that's just so important. When we're delivering these medicines at end of life, we want those plasma concentrations to stay level. We don't want peaks and troughs. Okay, that's when we're going to get breakthrough with our symptoms um, and, and, and not ideal. It's more acceptable to the person being cared for. Um, remember, intramuscular, intravenous is quite invasive, so this subcutaneous is perfect for our palliative and end of life patients. Um, it's flexible, so we can start up a syringe driver and then we can stop it. Um, it's protected by an external lockbox. And I've got that lock box here, we can see. Um, it can be used at home as well and maintained over extended periods. Um, and the great thing about these syringe pumps is that we can often um, mix two, three, four, sometimes five medicines all at once in one syringe. Okay, so that's why these are so nifty and fabulous. So that's why. But let's look at then another question, Charles. Let's see how many answer this one. Thanks for the responses to the first one there as well. So uh, what are the main indications for use of the syringe pump? So what indications would we look for in our patients or our clients um, at our facilities? What are the main indications for using syringe pumps? Let's think about that. We got any responses yet, Charles? So think uh, about nothing yet, Emma. But yeah, don't be shy, everyone. Uh, pop pop your responses under the Q and A tab on the right hand side of the screen. No wrong answers. No right, wrong Emma. answers. <laughs> I've only probably got about two more, and then we'll talk later. But we have one uh, from Susan, yep. um, who's put poor vascular access. Great, Susan, thank you. Another one from Alana, pain and discomfort. Yep. Um, another is uncontrolled pain on palliation. Yep. Fabulous, thank you so much. Great thinking. So, um, we would start um, using a syringe pump. Of course, we always, the oral route is the best route, isn't it? But think about patients when they're coming to end of life or that they're palliative. Um, this is what you'd be using in your facilities. Um, that oral medications are probably not appropriate anymore or not likely to be effective. So when, when might that be? That might be when we've got persistent nausea and vomiting, okay? Um, when we're dysphagic, when we've got a, a horrible gastrointestinal obstruction, so a bowel obstruction or some terrible cancers there that are affecting how our medicines go orally and they can't get absorbed by the gut. Um, weakness and alteration in our level of consciousness. And, and we know as, as we're dying um, that um, swallowing goes and then, um, and then we go off, we get into an unconscious state and to sleep. Um, and so therefore we can't take our medicines anymore. So we wanna make sure that we're doing good symptom management. The contraindications for using um, syringe pumps are that we don't use these for blood or blood products. We do not use these for insulin and we do not use these for critical medications um, whose stoppage or interruption um, could cause serious injury or death. So that's that sort of whys, how and what have you. And we're going to talk more about how we set them up. But let's go to one of those videos that I um, recommended from the Care Search website. Let's, this is when we really see that technology works for us online. So let's, let's double check. I'm hoping, here we go. It just lets us know here that um, you might hear us talk about the Nikki T's. Nikki T's were the older model. You're so lucky you've got the great brand new one, the bodyguard. You might see the Nikki T in these videos, but it's same, same, okay? Same, same, just a little bit of different pictures. So here we go, let's Using syringe pumps in the clinical environment. 
This video discusses syringe pumps and why these devices are used. Syringe pumps are used to deliver medicine to safely manage palliative care symptoms such as nausea or pain. It can help to keep a person's symptoms under control so that they can be cared for safely while remaining in the place of their choice. A syringe pump is commonly used when the oral route of medicine administration is inappropriate or ineffective. For example, if the person has persistent nausea and vomiting, dysphagia, gastrointestinal obstruction, poor absorption of oral medicine, weakness, or an alteration in their level of consciousness. What is a syringe pump? A syringe pump is a portable, battery-operated device that delivers medicine safely at a constant rate over an extended period, usually 24 hours. This helps to maintain a steady blood level of the medicine to control the person's symptoms and may mean that a person does not need to have repeated injections. The syringe pump delivers medicine through a system including a subcutaneous cannula, which is placed in the subcutaneous tissue and held in place by a clear dressing. The subcutaneous cannula is connected to the syringe pump via a variable length of sterile tubing called an extension set. The extension set is attached to a syringe, which can contain various medicines as prescribed by a doctor or nurse practitioner for symptom control. The syringe is held in the syringe pump, which drives the syringe by pushing the plunger. This setup enables a nurse to draw up medicines as prescribed by a doctor or nurse practitioner into a syringe and place the syringe into the pump. The syringe pump, when activated, then pushes the syringe plunger so medicine goes through the extension set tubing and cannula and into the subcutaneous tissue as a continuous infusion. There are many advantages to using syringe pumps, including more acceptable to palliative patients than intramuscular or intravenous injections, able to provide a constant level of medicine, ensuring that the plasma concentration remains at the optimum therapeutic level with no peaks or troughs, suitable for all care settings. The Nikki T34 has many safety features, does not restrict a person's mobility, preset to deliver medicines over a fixed time period, protected by an external lockbox for syringes up to 30 mil, flexible and can be used intermittently, or discontinued if symptoms can later be managed by the oral route or if the symptoms resolve. The Nikki T34 is one type of syringe pump that is used widely in Australia. It has a proven record of safety and reliability. You can watch the following videos to learn more about the Nikki T34. Video 2 – Getting to know the Nikki T34 syringe pump Video 3 – Starting and subsequent day setup of Nikki T34 syringe pump infusions Visit palconsult.com.au for more information. Great. How'd we go there? These are fabulous videos. Um, and so if you were the champion of, of say, the, the bodyguard syringe pump in your facility, you could use those videos as, as part of your education, uh, rolling out. They're accessible of those links, and Charles is going to pop them in the chat there as well. Um, and, and great refresher videos as well for us. So let's go back to the beginning a bit again and talk about our subcutaneous cannula because whenever I'm travelling across the district and visiting people, um, we this is sometimes tricky for us to get our head around, but once we know these cannulas, we go, oh, great, we're going to use them well. So remember, we were looking at them here um, and we went through all the little different parts here. And it's important to remember that we're doing the sub cutaneous root because this is the most least invasive and gentle root for our patients that are dying, okay, our palliative patients. Um, so less invasive, less risk of infection, nowhere near as painful as the intravenous. We can do these really easily. Um, quick question for everyone, Charles, if we can. 
uh, let's talk about where would be the most common sites uh, that we would pop a um, cannula in, a subcutaneous cannula. So think about that. Where would we most, the most common sites that we would want to pop these subcutaneous cannulas? And so we're talking about our palliative patients. Where might they be? Let's give you a couple of minutes or no, a couple of seconds. We don't want minutes. Gosh, we'll all want to go home. To think about any answers, Charles? Uh, nothing's come no, through yet, Emma. Oh, I've got one from Susan in the abdomen. Great, Susan. Susan's done some good answers. Thanks, Susan, for participating. All right. So, our most common sites are the sites preferred by our patients. Remember, our patients are at the centre of our care. Um, so, that's their preference is, is first and foremost. But we need to look at where the availability of that nice bit of juicy subcutaneous tissue is. And remember for our dying patients or our palliative patients, they may not be well fleshed like me and, and have a lot of tissue around. So um, we have to think about patients' mobility and we have to look at their pressure area care needs. So, you know, if their favourite side's lying on this side, we're not going to want to put the subcutaneous um, cannula here, are we? Because that's their favourite side to lie on as well. So we want to make sure it's accessible. We need to think about those bony prominences, areas of broken um, skin or infection, um, irritated areas, we don't want to pop them in there either, skin folds, scarred areas, um, poor circulation. So abdomen, Susan, correct, and that's generally one of our favourite sites. But remember, if, if our patients have big ascites um, and we're looking at absorption, um, generally it's not going to absorb well there because it will generally go into that sort of big acidic tummy, not into where we want it to go. So think about that. And also think about if, um, say, for example, um, the disease process, um, especially um, abdominal cancers, we don't want to be going near tumour either. Okay, so think about that. Um, definitely where there's so edema, so we often go top of thighs as well. But if those thighs are very edematous, once again, the distribution of the medication is not going to work there either. Um, and looking at that um, lymph drainage um, and also for our patients that have had mastectomies. So um, if we look here, these are generally our most common sites. So top of the arms. Um, we can go up here as well. Our tummies are great and top of our thighs. Remember, we also might be dealing with patients that are confused or delirium, which is very common at end of life. So we might really want to go for the back of the arms as well or the scapula back here. But remember, we want to get a nice little bit of meaty skin to pop them into. I'm not going to go step by step as to how to insert a um, subcutaneous cannula. Um, now, beautiful CareSearch has these phenomenal um, double-sided sheets, um, information sheets. Um, these are what we use for caring at home when we're giving um, relatives, we teach relatives how to insert these at home. Um, that's what we do in Hunter, New England for certain people that are on a palliative care service. Believe you me, we don't teach everybody. It's the strict guidelines as to who we teach and how. But um, these are great resources to pop in your tub again with all of this equipment of exactly how to insert the um, subcutaneous cannula there. Um, on that note, on that point, I just want to note that we need to treat these cannulas with great respect, just like we would an intravenous cannula, okay? So we need to check and monitor them fourth hourly, just like we would an intravenous cannula. Remember, we can still, they're still susceptible to infection, they're still susceptible to be dislodged. We want to rotate the injection site as well. Um, we don't want to keep putting it in the one spot all the time because they do get red and irritated and also the, the plastic covering that goes on there as well can get red and irritated. Um, so we want to rotate the sites. And then also if, if it is they've got a favourite arm that it wants to go to, I'm showing you my arms because you really don't want to see my tummy. And, but, you know, you can 
go down a bit further or across a bit more okay so you don't have to that one spot wherever it's nice and fleshy but make sure we're rotating um how frequency uh, the frequency of how often we change them is by local policy our policy is inpatient they are changed every 72 hours um, out in the community that that differs um, also remember if we're using our little um, cannulas for giving breakthrough medication which I'm not covering today I'm just talking about the pumps um, you might want two in so one for giving the breakthrough medication and then another one on this side for the pump whilst I've got you there talking about that we never disturb the pump line and ever give medication into that whilst the pump's going. Once the pump line is on, that's just for the pump and the pump alone, okay? You don't disconnect and give medication through it. Um, you don't disturb that at all. You don't put a, another bung on the side of it. Let me just show you this. Let's pretend that we're connected to the patient. Let's go back to here. I hope I'll get my fingers out of the way. Let's pretend it's connected to the patient and we've got it secured there nicely. This is our syringe line to our pump, our bodyguard. We keep this cap on. So don't change it to a bung. I call these bungs. You might call them something different, but don't change to that because then people might inadvertently decide to give medication through there. Okay? Keep this one on. Never disconnect the line and give medication through. Once again, we're breaking and more infection and what have you. Okay. If this was, I'm jumping around a bit. I hope you're getting me here. If this was just for um, giving medications, okay, we might want to give medications this way as well. Like for example, our patient might be very nauseous and we want to just give a dose of Maxilon or on Dancitron, um, or they might need a breakthrough medication. That's a whole other education session. Hope I do good at this one. I can come back and tell you about that. Um, we would um, use this line. Let's just think about then, if this line only takes half a mil from here to here, say for example, I'm gonna give my patient morphine for pain. I just want you to really think about this while we're on this section. Say for example, I've got 10 milligrams of morphine in one mil, okay? 10 milligrams of morphine in one mil. If I pop this on to give to my patient and from here to here is 0.5 of a mil, here I go, I'm giving 0.5, the medicine's just reached the tip now, it's not even in the patient, here I go, I'm giving the rest of my medication. So I've got 0.5 of a mil has gone to the patient, I still have 0.5 in here. So that means I definitely have to flush this, otherwise they're only getting half the dose. When I flush with saline, I only need to flush half a mil, don't I? Because then, here I go, here's my half a mil. So here's my morphine still sitting in here. I'm flushing it through. Now they've got the whole dose. Okay. Remember, gosh, I, was, I could do a whole session on this as well. Um, Remember, we're not, we don't really want to give more than three mils via this route subcutaneously because you think all of that volume goes under the skin here and it can cause a big bubble. So we're not going to flush like we do a cannula and do a big five mil flush or a big 10 mil flush because our poor patients, their skin's not going to cope with that and we're going to have this big bubble here, okay? So the maximum we flush is five mils. Um, the maximum volume I'd really put in with medication would be up to three. Sometimes I could push to four mils on Dancitron, comes in four mils. 
or I might give two meals really, really slowly, have a little break and then give another two. But say for example, I could give morphine and midazolam in the one um, syringe so I can mix those two together because I know they're compatible. Pop them in but always flush afterwards. Don't have to flush before because I flushed after so I know there's saline in here. Are we okay with that one? Any questions there, Charles, with that? I sort of went a bit over the place there. But um, it's, it's, these are just so important. Oh, I did see the other day, why we, I saw the other day when I went to a facility where well, they actually had five of these in. And I said, oh, and they're all in the tummy. Um, the poor person wasn't absorbing them that well because they had edema and ascites in the tummy. And I said, oh, how come we've got five in? And they said, because this one's for the morphine, this one's for the midazolam, this one's for the dexamethasone, this one's for the... So we don't... We can put them all in one. Yeah? We happy with that? Don't forget we need to really chart these just like and document just like we would an intravenous cannula. So, so, so important. Um, checking, 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 fourth hourly, uh, documenting. Oh, that was the other thing. See this um, little tip here. Once we've taken our um, sharp out of there, this is so super duper duper fine and it can kink really easily, okay? So we just have to be so careful once we've inserted and we've got it secure, um, if there's movement, just watch that, that that can kink slightly there. So super duper fine. But once it's under the skin, we need to make sure we know that's plastic, there's no needle in there um, and we're educating our patients and our family on that also. We're happy with that. We're going to keep moving because, gosh, we've got a lot to cover and we've got a, a, a time limit. I could talk all day. Could you work that out? All right. So if we're needing to recite these um, little intimas frequently, we need to consider, um, oh, sorry, back to when we're using them for a syringe driver. Okay, if we're um, changing them frequently, we would want to consider maybe we need to dilute our mixture a little bit more. Uh, maybe we need to change it to a 12 hourly pump. We don't often do that. We need good medical guidance with that and pharmacological guidance, but we can. Um, we may need to change to a less irritating drug. Um, and with medical guidance, uh, we can often add a tiny little bit of dexamethasone in with our mixture um, as an anti-inflammatory if it's compatible. Um, we were talking about documentation before and we'll talk about this again when we're looking at our pumps. This is the form that we use across Hunter New England. So whenever we have somebody on a syringe pump, we need to be documenting and taking observations. So we're checking our sites fourth hourly, but we're also checking that our pump is working fourth hourly and checking the rate, um, the volume that's been infused, um, the battery, whether it's locked. So if we just have a look at our little um, ob sheet here, and you might have a, a different different one in your facility, but for Hunter New England, uh, this is what we use. So we're making sure we've got our date there and our time. I would all, always check when I come on my shift, I always check my pump with the nurse going off the shift so that there's no discrepancy there. Um, and we know, oh, yep, that's what was handed over. And I always check that before they leave. So I would be doing that at my seven o'clock handover. I'm looking at my rate. I'm going to go into this a little bit further, but let's just bear with me while I talk about this um, monitoring. I'm going to look at the volume to be infused. So just like if we were um, popping up a bag of a thousand mils of normal saline, I'd be checking to see if it was going at a hundred mils an hour that after three hours that there's only 700 mils left and 300 mils have gone. I'm checking that with these pumps as well. I'm checking my infusion time remaining. So this one here, um, the example I've given you has got 22 hours to go. I'm checking the battery life, which is super duper important. I'm checking that my syringe is locked um, on the pump, that that's, there's a lock and we'll talk about that in a moment. I'm also checking that the lock box is locked and I'll talk about that in a moment as well. 
um, and I'm also documenting that my site's checked. The little bit in the other there, I like to really document where my little breakthrough line is, my spare one, and where my infusion line is, and, and that we've signed it off. Okay, we going all right? Everyone okay, Charles? I hope so. Yes, we're ready. We're going to get into no this. questions, but you're getting some nice comments. Great. Explaining things very well. Good. Okay, we're going back to basics. When you got your bodyguard tees um, at your facility, in the box you would have got this great, fabulous little book that went along with it as well. And this one's a keeper. Don't chuck this one out. This one has all the little bits and pieces in it, um, tells you what all the alarms are for, um, how to keep it clean and all of that. These are fabulous little brochures, okay? So keep them in your special box as well. You also would have got um, just the um, an, another directions for use, a little bit more thorough, um, but really this is the only one that we need. Okay, so keep them in sight. What I would say to you all is really become familiar with your pump, okay? We can turn this on and off, we can touch it, we can move it, uh, we can read what's on it, we can play with the back, we can take the batteries in and out. Have a really good look at it, okay? Just don't be frightened to turn them on and have a play. You should be well informed of how these work well before we have to pop it on one of our patients or clients, okay? I'm sorry if I say patient, but that in my world they're patients. Um, residents. Um, so have a good play, be familiar with it, know what each of these buttons means um, and have a good look. The other thing that I want you to really look at is, is look at all the equipment that goes with it. So be really familiar with your intimates, how they click on and off, uh, pardon me, your syringe lines, okay, what they're made of, um, you know, how much fluid it would take in this syringe line, um, what dressings you put on, what batteries you use and where they are, the keys for the lockbox, um, where they're kept, how the lockbox actually works, um, what syringes you use. You can use a different, couple of different types of syringes, uh, what labels we use. So really have a look at all of your equipment and be extra familiar with that. Um, yeah, let's keep going. So this whole picture will come together very shortly. I've got to give you all these little tidbits of information so that when we do the whole setup, you understand where we're coming from. So when we're mixing up um, a syringe to pop in the syringe pump to deliver to a patient, our doctors have determined what medicine's going to go in the syringe, okay? So they might have said, for example, somebody, they just might say, um, this is a, an example, that they just want 10 milligrams of morphine in that syringe. That's all they want, okay? And we're looking at um, a constant background of pain relief over a 24 hours of period um, based on what the patient's um, medication and symptom needs were. So we pop our 10 milligrams of morphine in our syringe and then we can't just give that 10 milligrams straight because it's quite toxic and irritant to the skin and that would only take up one mil. So what we have to do is we add a, a diluent. I used to call it a dilutant but it's a diluent is the proper word and I can never say that properly but and sodium chloride is the recommended diluent, okay? Because we want to make sure that, that that medicines that we're giving is nice and diluted, um, so it's not toxic and can be distributed over the 24 hours. So the preferred one is normal saline. Remember, if we're giving cyclozine, it needs to be in water. But you'll look at the guidelines as to what you need to mix up in. And our preferred volume is to 20 mils, okay? So 20 mils in our syringe. So um, that's that, 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 20 mils. Some people say 18 mils. I, I go to some facilities and they go 18. These syringes, this the, the pump can go up to 23 mils, in fact, in a um, 
in a, a syringe. It can take 23 by the, the plunger and what have you here. Um, but so just, just go to 20. Or everything should be diluted to 20 unless we're told otherwise. I'm just going to throw something else into the mix here. Bear with me while we're learning this. If I'm giving lots of medicines and it's very potent and it needs to be mixed up with lots of diluent, I can use a 50 ml syringe and I can draw it up to 30 ml. Okay, that will fit in here. I'm doing, doing it around the wrong way. That will fit in here. But what won't fit, if I have to mix it up in this, and this doesn't happen very often, it won't fit in the lock box. Just bear with me. This lock box, it won't fit in. Okay, there is a special lock box when we go up to a bigger syringe. And it probably would be good for you to have that in your facility. Um, the reps can get that in for you. But commonly, we use the 30 mil syringe, um, draw it up to 20 mils. But just be aware, sometimes we can draw it up to 30, but we need a bigger lock box. Making sense? All right. There is, on these amazing sites that I've shown you, step-by-step um, -step guides as to how to draw up the medicines into this syringe, okay? So I'm not going through that today because we should all be capable and competent of drawing up our medicines and turning it into 20 mils. So I'm not going through that today of how to draw up our medication but let's just pretend I've drawn up all my medicines to the order that the doctor has prescribed and I've got it to 20 mils here, okay? And I've filled out all the details on the little sticky note here, okay? I'm not going into that today. There's step-by-step -step guides that show us through that. What we are going to do though, Charles, I've just realised I haven't even looked at the time and there's no clock in here, so I absolutely have no idea how I'm going for time. I could be talking forever. How are we going? It's a quarter to three, so we still have about 45 minutes. Oh, great. <laughs> okay. All right. We're going all right then. Is everyone okay out there in virtual land? Good. Okay. So let's start by actually having a bit of a play with, um, with our pumps. And what we're going to do is we're going to We've already quite we've already had a play of this before we're pon popping it on the patient. I'm just going to show you a, a few things here. So what we need to make sure most importantly is that we have a battery, okay? A nine volt battery. The um, the guidelines tell you exactly what type of battery to use. Um, there, this so our nine volt battery slips in the back here, okay? And the cover slides on. What we're going to do is we're going to turn it on. We've got our little on button here. And it's going to do something for us. It is going to do... Oh, it's going to tell me to send it for service. That is hilarious, but so good. So it, it, these need to be serviced every 12 months and it'll tell you when it's time for to go for a service. So this is very handy. But if I've only got one of these in my facility and I need it now, I can override that by pressing yes and put a little note, I think this one needs to go for a service. So it does its own little calibration there and you saw the little actuator move in and out and it does like a little preloading. And then it tells me to load the syringe, okay? So um, it's telling me what to do there. So let's, let's see what my slide says. Uh, from, with no syringe in place and the barrel clamp barrel arm down, that's this one here, um, it will tell us it does that whole pre-loading uh, there. We need to keep our fingers away from these movable parts um, and we wait for the prompt. And the prompt is saying load syringe. Pretty, tells us what to do. So then what we're going to do is load the syringe. So if you can see here what I'm doing, this is where I would be placing the syringe, okay? 
But if, for example, I've accidentally drawn it up to 23 mils, that's not going to fit, is it? So what I can do is, I'm going to try and do this and this at the same time and be a magician on, I can move it, oh, I probably couldn't show you that that well. Let me try this way with my fingers around this way. I can move the little actuator in and out without my syringe in there to get it to the exact where my syringe would be. I hope you're understanding that. So I've drawn my medicines up to 20 mils. I've turned my pump on and then I sort of give it a bit of a line up to check. Generally, it always goes back to this default setting here. So if it doesn't, I can use my back and forward arrows. Are we getting it? To pop it in there. So when I go to pop it in, this is this little barrel clamp arm here. I put it around and I load my syringe in here. And I don't want to lose any out the end. I would have my little needle cap on here. I don't want to lose any out the end because that's really important mixture that we want to get to our patient. There's sensors in here, there's sensors in here. So we need to make sure that it's all nicely locked in. It doesn't lock in this way with the little arms hanging out the side here. The little arms like to be in their little sleeves there. Okay, so that's nicely locked in and then I pop my barrel clamp back over and down. Okay, we happy with that? What's it tell, telling me now? I don't know, can we see that? It's telling me what type of syringe is in there. So it's come up and told me I'm using a 30 mil BD plastic pack. And that's exactly what the one, it registers what type of syringe I'm using. So let's have a look then, just out of an experiment here. Oh, can you see me? Let's go, let's just try it with this 50, because this is what I've drawn up to, 30 mils. So once again, I'm popping it in, locking it down, get the barrel clamp up and over, checking that all my sensors are right. Load syringe, and it's telling me that I've got in there a 50, 60 Nipro. So it acknowledges what type of syringe you're using. Let me go back to my favourite one. This is my 30ml uh, BD plastic pack. And with this one over, you become really easy at doing this. So let's pop this one back in. Just watch that little barrel arm here. This one, you just got to be careful with him. Checking, checking. And it's told me once again that it's a 30 mil BD plastic pack. Okay. Now, if, for example, it registered the wrong syringe, at this point in time, I can use the up down arrow and scroll and tell the, what syringe I actually have in there. Okay. So I can use this up down arrow, which will tell me exactly what syringe. So that's in the syringe detection and confirmation. Now these are all in those resources that I first showed you, these step-by-steps. And then let me get back to my BD plastic pack. Let me just find it. Then I'm going to say yes. That is the syringe I've got here today. And I'm saying yes. So then it's coming up with this next slide. So what it is telling me, we've already done that, load and confirm the syringe. Sorry, I'm looking at my laptop to make sure that I'm staying on track um, as well. Um, we've aligned that, we've fitted that in. Then what it does, it is telling me then on my little screen here, it's telling me the volume, the duration, the rate, and whether I press yes or no here. Let's go to the next one. 
So what I really need to do is really confirm that this is correct and that I'm happy with this before I say yes or no. So I'm double checking. This one's come up, it's volumes 18.7. So you think you're smack bang on the, um, on the money, but the, the sensors read it. It's telling me that my pump's going for 24 hours. Okay, I'm happy with that. That's the default setting as well. Um, sometimes we'll set them to 48, sometimes we set them to 12, but it's 24 is general there. And it's telling me my rate is 0.78. Okay, remember we've only got this volume, this 20 mil volume over 24 hours. We're going to have a really tiny um, infusion rate. But we need to document them down. Remember that's where I had um, up before our little OBS chart. Okay, so we need to be writing all that down straight away now on our OBS chart. So, um, here, we, we don't, oh, it's telling me, oh, good work, pump. It's telling me it's been paused for too long. Thank you, could you hear that? And I'm just going to press yes, I acknowledge that. Otherwise, it'll keep annoying me. And it just goes back to the, that screen there. What have I got in my notes there? Um, yes, yes, yes. Yep. And... Great. So, I haven't got my extension set connected as yet, have I? So, now it's time to connect my extension set. I haven't even gone near the patient yet. I would be doing all of this in the drug room. These are the, these are amazing extension sets. We love these. These are Codan extension sets. Um, they're really thin. They're about 150 centimetres long. I've tried and tested them and they take very little volume out of that syringe here. Um, so you've got one end for the patient, which is that one, which would connect to our little intima, but we're not going to do that yet. And then this end for the pump. So I've got that connected. Just remember like when we're connecting any line that we need to check that our connections are right, okay? Um, and secure because we don't want leakage there. So let's think about this for a minute. We've got our medication in here. We haven't got it in our line. So we need to prime the line. But um, the body card tees, they use this word called purge. Um, very American, isn't it? But we, we, we say prime. So we need to prime the line. So we need to get this medicine here. So the way we do that is trying to do it so I can we press this back arrow here I don't know whether I can do it yet and it says purge here so this is really important because we need to prime our line or purge I've just got to turn it this way for a second we press our back arrow I can do it this way and then the start button the green one at the same time oh, I thought I could be a magician and do this. Oh my, I need a hand model, don't I, to do this for me. And you can, s oh, 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 I can't do it. I can't, can you see me straining here? I'm doing it this way. And if I press them at the same time, it's purging my line. And what I'm doing, I'm watching it. I'm watching the fluid. I'm watching until it goes to the end. Okay, and then I stop purging. And I just take my fingers off. Are we okay? Charles, is everybody okay? You get that? Yeah. Good work. So, now my volume is going to be different. My rate is going to be exactly the same, which is the most important. My volume in the syringe is different because I've got about two mils in here. So I need to write those observations down again because this is post-priming the line, okay? You may have seen um, the old syringes, the old um, Nikki T's. We used to take them out and do a manual purge um, and then pop them back in. These ones don't do that. You have to do that 
um, purge that way and I'm going to have this all messed up now that I've touched it. Um, I'm confirming and I confirm to resume. My rate is still the same. That is so important because, but it's now over 22 hours, not 24. But that's okay because I've got that in the line here. If I didn't, if, if the rate doesn't stay the same and I don't do the purge, it means my dose is going to be different for the patient. Takes a little bit to get your head around that part there. Okay, so important to do that purge via the machine because then it will go back to the right rate. We need to keep that rate always the same. That's why it's so important to, um, to keep an eye on that. Let's just have a quick look at the slide there. So um, look at the dot points. If you use less than two mils volume to purge, the purge complete screen will not display. This is okay as long as there's drops of fluid come out of the end here. So it doesn't have to be two mils. Some, some lines take less than that. And because you've primed the extension set with approximately two mils of volume, the pump will not run the full 24 hours, okay? It will finish approximately two hours early, which is what I've just been saying. This only occurs on day one, when we're putting up the um, pump for the first time. If I'm changing the pump tomorrow and it's exactly the same dose, bear with me, we'll, it'll make sense in a minute, exactly the same dose. When I go to put my new one on, I'm in the drug room, I've drawn up my medicines in my syringe, just like I did the day before, it's exactly the same dose. When I go to the patient, I take this one out, I disconnect, I put the new one on, I've still got the drug in the line because I don't need to change that today. I put it all in, do exactly the same again. This will run over 24 hours because I don't need to prime my line day two. Do we get that? It's a little bit hard to get our head around, but trust me on that one. So day one, it'll run through in 22 hours. Day two and subsequent days, it'll run through um, 24 hours. It's telling me pump pause too long. I'm just going to say yes, okay. Um, the other thing with that, which I'll just note now, if the doctor comes along and tells me um, this is not a good enough dose, we need to increase the dose or add a new drug into it, I discard the whole amount and start afresh again because it takes about two hours for all of this drug to reach the patient. If this patient's in pain and we've got a new order, I want to make sure that this drug gets to the patient as soon as I can. So I prime a whole new line, okay? I don't necessarily pop a new one of these in, but I prime a whole new line, okay? If there's a new order or after 72 hours because we, we've got, still got an infection control. Charles, is everybody going okay there? Are we, are we right? Questions or comments, so you must be explaining things perfectly. Oh, I right? hope so. That part's a little bit tricky, but everything else isn't. Oh, it's not that tricky once you get your head around it. So, we want to make sure that we um, confirm our brand. We did that. We can revise our um, infusion after we've primed it, so we've double checked that our rate's still the same. We're making sure that we're right there. Yep, yep, yep. That's correct. It's a 30 mil B. BD plastic pack, and I read that out to my friend that I'm checking it with. Remember, this is a double, a double check. So I go, yep, 30 mil BD plastic pack, and I show my friend, yep, we can all see that. And then I'm confirming my rate again. I'm checking my OBS, and then I'm going to press start again. Oh, my fingers are in the way. Start infusion. Yes, I'm very happy. So I'm starting my infusion. So off we go. Oh, I better connect it to the patient. We had it connected, remember? It was connected there. And in the um, little information sheets, they show you how to put your sticker on and all that. I'm not going into that today. All right, so now we've, we've started our infusion. Okay. Oh. 
let's go to this slide because I've sort of missed it. But, you know, we're connecting it to the patient, of course. It doesn't matter that I started it then, a point of reach, but connect it to the patient, start infusion. So we're off and we're running. Let's just check here. So we know it's running because, and you may not be able to see it because of the light and what have you, there's a little light here above the um, on-off button that flashes green. And in the little screen here, there's little arrows that go across the screen that show that it's working. So I double check that and make sure that that's doing that. Pump delivering. Um, then, what I must do then is I lock it. So that's the little information key here. I press and hold that down. Is it doing it? And that will tell me that sound showed that the syringe was locked. And that means I can touch virtually everything here. Oops. But it is going to keep showing up that the syringe is locked. I don't think you can see the screen, but you can. So that means that inadvertently it can't be pressed. Um, remember, we send people home in the community with these. Um, so we don't want them adjusting all of this rate. But what I can still do is look at my little information button and I can still toggle through all the screens um, to check all my settings, but my syringe is locked. Then what I must do, it must be in a lock box because remember the medication that we're dealing with and it's the safety of the pump and checking all the settings. So then slides in old, to the good old lock box. I'm double checking my settings. Over we go. We really want to double check that this is right here and that it all, oh, here we go, slides down nicely. Be careful of this little part here because that can often get a bit loose. These used to snap a lot here or leak, um, so really check that site there. That's part of our checks. Then we've got our key. And we're checking that that's locked, which it is. So, so important because um, often we're dealing with S4, S8 drugs and they must be locked and the keys put away nice and safely, often with your drug keys. So, um, we're up and running. It's on our patient. Uh, we're checking our little site, we're checking our connections, uh, we're checking here, we come back, we can see that the pump's running, the green light's flashing, but it's not set and forget. So we're looking at that every four hours. The other thing is, is that we're really looking at, is this working? Okay, is this working for our patient? Is this relieving their symptoms? Is it doing the job that it's meant to do? Now remember if it's running at such a tiny rate and then it's going to take a fair bit of time to get to the patient, our blood plasma levels may not reach peak effect until about six hours after the pump has started. So really think about that. We're not going to get the perfect setting. It's going to take a bit of time. So they might need some other form of medication in the meantime until this has reached effect. Okay, so really, really think about that. Um, and relatives might go, oh, it's not working, hasn't done what it needs to do, or you might be in a panic, or you think, oh my God, they're still in pain, because this is going to take a little bit of time to reach effect. Sometimes there are people might have um, pain patches on, um, and doctors may advise for those pain patches to stay on. Um, it's very important that that's documented. Or if they do ask for them to re be removed, they might ask them to be removed after six hours. So once the, the pump started there as well. Um, so you might need to give the medicine a different way until it reaches that great level that we're after. And so it might be that you give that breakthrough medicine in another little intima that you've got available. Um, thinking about then, th these aren't just set and forget that this is going to be, this is going to work effectively. It can sometimes take a fair bit of um, trial and error to get the right balance here. So really looking at our patients, listening to our patients, listening to the family, using our own sixth sense because we need to know these people well. Is this working well? Are we happy with that? What else have I got there? The key lock. Oh, okay. 
So if I want to turn the key lock off, I just press and hold again. And it comes off. Okay, so use that as your default that, um, that it's locked. So I can go through, I can be checking all my settings. I'm also checking my battery level here. This battery is really good. But if it was low, I can in fact change the battery without undoing everything. So, oh, I can hear it alarming. Probably should have stopped it, but I don't have to. So we also teach relatives how to change the battery in the home. It's giving me a nice little audible alarm there. It's turned itself off. I'm going to turn it back on. Sister Mera, press and hold for details. <laughs> this is great. Look, it's telling me there's a Sister Mera here. Send for service. Okay. Wait for the beep. Oh, here we go. Let's see what it does now. Let's try again. This will be embarrassing, won't it? Oh, still send for service. Yes, I know that. Load syringe, it's telling me. I'm double checking. Yes, that is the one that I had again. Oh, this one's telling me warning volume too low. Because I haven't got the right thing in here. Oh, goodness. See, look, you'll throw it by this time, but don't because it's all, <laughs> it's all rectifiable. Basically, we just start again and it'll say press to resume and we resume. But because I probably don't have any fluid in there, it's not reading that there. But we can change the batteries without even taking them out of the lockbox there. All right, let's look at what our next slide is. Um, okay, so this is once we've got all started. There are little carriers we could put them in as well. But if our patient's not ambulant, I just like them sitting where they're visible on the bed um, so you can see them and monitor them well. Um, and remember, document, 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 and document again, okay? Um... So this little slide, let's just have a look at this. So we're dealing with extreme low doses here. So when we draw it up to a standard 20 mil, generally our rates are going to be between, because of how they're calibrated, 0.77 and 0.86 mils per hour. Okay, so that's sort of standard. So if you're getting above or below that, um, you might want to really review what you've done. Okay, let's keep going with here. Um, this one says monitoring during infusion. So we talked about this. We want to make sure that all our connections um, are secure. Uh, there's no signs of damage to the lockbox. If you drop these, they break so easy. The little lugs here break um, super duper easy. That the keypads are locked. We're checking that the little arrows and that the green light's going here as well. Um, and we said to activate or deactivate the lock, we press and hold our um, little button here uh, for five seconds and you heard that beep. What other key points have I got here? Um, yep, so we already said that, that the little light's going, the arrows are going here and that we can toggle through so that we can check our infusion rate, how much it's got to go so you're getting prepared. Um, for popping the next one up. Um, yep, we've done that. Uh, this one, what have I got here? Checking the screen whilst um, monitor the infusion and pump over time. We've already said that. So it's important that it's not just set and forget that we need to keep monitoring there. Uh, this is just reaffirming what I was saying to you before, that if the doctor has changed the, the prescription, that we need to make sure that we change the line um, and start afresh again. New extension set. So, let's watch this video that they don't do it as clumsy as I do. Uh, let's watch this video and, and I think this will make it all, all um, click. Are we okay? Everybody ready? Let's just double check that it works and we've got volume. Remember it's telling us that this is based off the Nikki T. Um, we're using the bodyguards. I love these videos. So you can set these up. Um, let's go. Just double check that's working. Here we go.
This video explains the process of using a Nikki T34 syringe pump. The Nikki T34 syringe pump is pre-programmed to infuse solutions over 24 hours for palliative care patients. It calculates infusion rates to the second decimal point in millilitres per hour based on the exact volume in the syringe. Consequently, slight variations in syringe volumes will result in slight variations in infusion rates. With a syringe volume of approximately 20 millilitres, infusion rates will typically vary between 0.77 and 0.86 millilitres per hour. This video shows the process of setting up the syringe pump on day one of a new order and continuing it on subsequent days. The medicine rates shown in this video are examples only. This video assumes a subcutaneous cannula has already been inserted into the person. It is recommended you use a 30 milliliter Lua Lock syringe filled with medicines and diluent to a volume of 20 mil. Gather the equipment you will need on a clean working surface. The Nikki T34 syringe pump, a nine volt battery that has been tested for sufficient battery charge and inserted in Nikki T34 syringe pump, a 30 milliliter Lua Lock syringe, a medicines added label and pen, the medicines order from the prescriber, medicine ampules, alcohol wipes, diluent, blunt drawing up needle, an extension set, sharps container, gloves and personal protective equipment according to your local policies and procedures, the lockbox for the Nikki T34 syringe pump, a pouch or holster for the syringe pump, wash your hands, Now complete a medicines added label using the information on the medicine order. The following details are required on the label. The person's name, date of birth and identification number. The medicine names. The dose of each medicine. The diluent name. The date and time the syringe was prepared. The initials of the individuals preparing and checking the syringe. Put the prepared label aside while you prepare the syringe and medicines. Next, prepare the syringe for loading. Attach drawing up needle to the 30 milliliter Lua Lock syringe. Remove the needle cap and draw up the medicine as per the medicine order. Draw up the diluent. Fill the syringe with medicines and diluent to a volume of 20 mil. Replace the needle cap. Attach the medicines added label to the syringe. It is important to ensure that the label is flat and does not interfere with the barrel clamp or obscure the measurement gradient, as shown. Dispose of the empty medicine ampules in the sharps container and any rubbish in the bin. Do not attach the extension set to the subcutaneous cannula or the syringe yet. Turn on the syringe pump by pressing the on-off key. Wait for the actuator to complete its automatic movement sequence. The screen will show pre-loading until the actuator stops moving. Once the actuator stops, the screen will show load syringe. Pick up the syringe and hold it against the top of the pump and using it as a guide, adjust the position of the actuator by pressing either FF or back keys. This will align the syringe collar to the collar sensor and the plunger sensor to the syringe plunger. It is important not to use force to try to move the actuator manually as this could damage the device. Load the syringe into the syringe pump. Lift the barrel clamp arm by gently lifting it up as far as it goes turning the arm 180 degrees and slowly lowering it to the down position. Load the syringe into the pump, ensuring the syringe collar is sitting vertically in the collar sensor and the syringe plunger is centered in the plunger sensor. 
lift and turn the barrel clamp arm to hold the syringe in place. Check the position of the syringe in the three sensors to ensure the syringe has remained in position. Select the correct syringe brand using the up or down key. Then press yes when the correct brand is displayed. For example, choose 30 milliliter BD Plastipak. Review the infusion settings. Check and review the data displayed on the screen. Volume of medicine, duration of infusion, rate of infusion. Confirm the settings by pressing the yes key. The screen will display start infusion. Do not commence the infusion yet as the extension set must be primed. Remove the drawing up needle and dispose of it in the sharps container. Open the extension set packet, remove the set from the packet and screw it onto the end of the syringe. Only one end of the set can correctly connect to the syringe as shown. Now prime the extension set tubing. Press the FF key. The screen will display Purge, Disconnect Patient. Confirm by pressing Yes. Prime the extension set by pressing and holding the FF key until approximately 2 ml of volume has passed into the tube and a small amount of fluid comes out of the other end of the extension set. Release the FF key. The screen will display Purge Completed. If you use less than 2 ml volume to purge, the Purge Completed screen will not display. This is OK as long as fluid has come out of the end of the extension set. Because you have primed the line with approximately 2 milliliters of volume, the pump will not run for the entire 24 hours. It will finish approximately 2 hours early. The infusion rate will not change. Reselect correct brand of syringe. Press yes to resume. Confirm the infusion data after priming. The screen will display the revised volume and duration. The rate will remain constant, for example 0.84 milliliters per hour. Check that all the information on the summary screen is correct and matches the medicine order. Confirm the information by pressing yes. The screen will display start infusion. The pump is now set up correctly and is ready to be connected to the person. Now take the pump to the person and place it on the bedside table or beside the person on the bed. The infusion can now be started. Wash your hands again and don gloves or personal protective equipment as required. Use an alcohol wipe to swab the end of the subcutaneous cannula. Remove the cap from the end of the extension set and connect it to the person via the subcutaneous cannula. The screen will display Start infusion. Press yes. The pump will now begin delivering the medicine to the person. Whilst infusing, the syringe pump screen shows key infusion parameters including the time remaining of the infusion, the infusion rate and the syringe brand and size. The delivery of medicines is indicated by a message on the display, pump delivering and a green LED light on the keypad that flashes once approximately every 30 seconds. Activate the keypad lock. Press and hold the info key until a bar is displayed moving from left to right. Continue to hold the info key down until the bar has moved completely across the screen and a beep sounds to confirm the lock has been activated. For safety, the stop key can still be activated when the keypad is in locked mode. If you press stop, Press yes to start the pump again. Place the syringe pump in the lockbox, close the lid and lock it with the key. Place it in a pouch or holster if needed. Complete the documentation as per your service's local policies and procedures. Monitor the infusion. This step can be completed while the syringe is in the lockbox. At regular intervals, as well as checking the patient, check the syringe pump to confirm the infusion is running correctly, at least once every 24 hours in the community.
at least once every four hours in an inpatient facility. Check the screen to confirm the syringe pump is still running at the same infusion rate as originally set. Check the screen is intermittently showing the pump delivering and syringe information animation. Check for signs of physical damage to the syringe pump and lockbox. Press the info key once to check volume to be infused, VTBI, and volume infused, VI. The syringe graphic on the screen shows VTBI and VI in graphical form. Press the info key twice to check for battery life remaining, shown as a percentage and in graphical form. The battery life should show a minimum of 30% remaining. The syringe pump will alarm to indicate the need to replace the battery. We're going to um, keep moving because we're going to run out of time. I, I you know, I... I've, I've underestimated um, my my timing here, so we'll keep moving. There's the, in the booklets tell you all about the alarms. The pump tells you about the alarm. They're pretty pretty intuitive, and you can pretty much well um, navigate them. Um, so we'll move over that nice and quickly. Um, it shows you what it's alarming for, whether it's a low battery, whether it's been paused too long, which we saw before, whether the syringe has been displaced, um, or whether there's an occlusion stopping, and that could be from the little intima or the line. Um, we talked about the lockbox, uh, which is so important. Cleaning, which is give them a good wipe over and store them away. Um, there's still controversy as to whether you store it with the battery in or without the battery. We'll leave that for the reps um, to tell us about that. I know we really want to do questions, but the biggest thing that I the take home today is really educating our patients, our clients, our residents and our family about these. It is so, so, so important. Um, these aren't the death machines. Um, they're not the euthanasia machines. They say, oh my goodness, we're putting up the morphine. Um, we really need to be educating our patients and family what these are for. Remember, not every patient that is dying needs a syringe pump or a bodyguard T. Not everybody that's dying needs a syringe pump, okay? Um, but we need a syringe pump to do symptom management when it can't be managed by any other method, okay? Please, please, please really inform our um, family. The websites that I've been telling you about have great family information um, sheets. Um, please go online and do the education modules on there. Um, you can also do competencies in your facility and make sure um, that you're all up to date and that you're all competent in these and they can go in your um, in your um, PDR file as well. I did want to talk about prescribing today, but that I think is a whole other session. Um, this is the prescribing forms that we use for Hunter New England, and I can go on about these, but let's, we're running out of time today. One of the biggest things that I really do want you to do though is, is to think about prescribing and think about what the doctors have charted and why. And it's okay for us to question that um, with curiosity um, as to, may I ask why you've charted that dose, why you've chose that medication. Um, we're within our right to do that um, and feel really comfortable when we're popping up a syringe pump. Not just pop it up, um, but and then and really look at that symptom management for, for best care for our patients. I've gone way over time, Charles. Uh, any questions out there? Let's see what we've got online. Oh, I hope they're not too hard either, Charles. <laughs> no questions yet, but please do uh, type them in now. We've got five minutes left. We, we could probably stay on an extra five minutes, couldn't we? Can I we? know that how busy you all are, mm. um, and if you need to leave, we understand. I've just launched the evaluation survey as well, so you'll see that in the polls tab. If you could please fill that out before you log off, we'd really appreciate your feedback. I'm sure it'll all be mm. excellent, Emma. It'll be. Um, well, I hope so. I've got Slido here on my phone, so please uh, let's take the opportunity whilst we've got Emma here um, to type in any questions that you may have, um, and we can ask them. Of Emma now. It's a lot to take on, but 
trust me, they're easy to use. Okay, they really are. Become familiar. You can play with it with it not being on the patient. You could see today that I used it without medication. Um, have a play with just saline. Um, set up your box. Set up your education resources um, so that they're all in one spot, easy to use. But you need to be familiar with it well before we start putting them on our patients. So runs, have some dummy runs. Yeah. We've just got one question from Christine. Can we get a copy of that monitoring form? Well, I'm sure you can. It's Hunter New England wide, and so I don't know um, your facilities. You can order them all online, but we'll, we'll get in touch with how you order them. Okay. So they're standard stock uh, monitoring forms. Um, so important to monitor, monitor, monitor. Yeah. Document, document, document. Um, a question from Emily. How long is the battery life of the pumps? Oh, great question, Emily. And so much controversy. So the old pumps, the batteries used to run out quite quickly. Um, that's why they've upgraded these. If it's running at, say, one to two mils per hour, they say that the battery life, I think, is about, well, don't quote me, I think it was about 50 hours. Um, if it runs at five mils per hour, it might have been 30 hours. I probably haven't seen that in practice, to be honest, uh, but I probably we, we do get a good 48 hours out, out of the battery. But you, you do keep monitoring your battery when you're doing your OBS. And on our little observation form, it says um, battery, the percentage. Note, change battery at 20%. So we always like to um, change our battery at that because once it sort of reaches that 20%, the battery life runs pretty quick after that. You don't want to be called out. Um, but remember I showed you, you can just change the battery while it's still in the lockbox. Um, but generally get 48 hours out of them. Any other questions, Charles? Just some lovely comments saying thank you for the training. Very thorough. It's had great resources. Great. Um, any final questions, anyone? Please type them in now. These have done well. It's a lot to take on. So just a reminder, the session is being recorded um, and we will make the recording link publicly available. So feel free to share it, um, obviously, amongst your facilities or any sister facilities. So we'll have that um, available on our website, but I'll email all of you who have registered with that direct link. Um, so yeah, so we very much encourage the train the trainer model, so yep, the things that you've learned today to share with your other clinical team members as well. And just remember local guidelines, your local policy procedures, I'm from Hunter New England and what I've um, based this education session on today is what we use and our policy procedures. Um, the education resources, fabulous links there, use them, um, heaps of resources out there. Uh, there's a question, if there's an issue with the pump, who do we call? Yeah, um, the, the reps. Yeah. yeah. And that will be in your box that you've got issued. Um, and they're fabulous. And they can talk things over, over the phone with you. Yeah. And you should have, say, a biomedical... Have they, they should have someone that they get sent to, who, yeah, like whoever your facility, like your biomedical... Engineer. Engineer yes. people. Yes, yeah. they do have a, co that's a good question. So Medilogic do have a contact that they use, so Medilogic rep will be able to provide you with those details of the, yeah. who they use. someone yep. locally. Yes. Yeah, we send all ours to the John or to Tamworth um, and they look after all ours. Yeah. Uh, just lots of thank yous. Thank you, so, everyone. Excellent. Well, that's right on time. Great. Um, so thank you, Emma. That You're was welcome. very informative. I'm sure you all online are in joining me in saying a big thank you. <laughs> um, appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to be with us today. Um, and yeah, thank you as well for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, like I mentioned, that evaluation poll is live at the moment. If you could just take a minute to uh, fill that in for us before we log off, we really appreciate it. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, feel free to get in touch with me as needed. And yeah, all the best with using your syringe driver and thank you for all of the work that you do supporting your residents at end of life. So, Thanks, Charles. Thanks again, Emma. Bye, everyone. Take care. Have a good afternoon.